Hello everyone and welcome to this morning's webinar serving public library customers in the midst of the opioid epidemic. My name is Charlie Taylor and I'm a continuing educa education consultant here at KDLA, the Department for Libraries and Archives, and I'm going to be facilitating today's webinar and working in the background. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. First of all, this session is being recorded and it will be available um, in our on online uh, learning platform uh, portal within about a week's time, hopefully less than that. Uh, you'll be able to share that and invite anybody else from your library or your community that you think might be interested. Please feel free to use the chat today for any questions you might have for our presenters or any technical issues that you encounter. If you haven't found the chat yet, you'll see a purple tab in the bottom right hand corner of the screen with an arrow on it. Just click that and it will expand a white panel and you'll see a chat bubble there at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to make use of that. Any conversations you want to have? Any questions? The slides for today's presentation as well as several handouts. Um, there's a great resource guide. Uh, lots of good handouts are still available inside the Blackboard Learn course room. You should still have that tab open on your computer, um, but you'll go into the slides and PDFs folder inside that room to get all those downloads. I do recommend getting those lots of good resources that are going to be available from today's webinar. And finally, you may have seen a notification about closed captioning. You can watch clo live closed captioning within the course room. You can also use our stream text service. If you'll click that link that I just put into the chat. Um, you can, it'll open a separate tab on your computer where you can view the, the captions separately and adjust the font and things like that. So, all right, without any further ado, we're going to move into our presentations for today. Our first presenter, um, unfortunately, was ended up being unavailable today, but he was generous enough to record his session ahead of time. His name is Van Ingram. He is the executive director for the Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy. He's been there since 2004. Um, the Office of Drug Control Policy coordinates Kentucky's substance abuse efforts in enforcement, treatment, and prevention and education. Van has served with the Maysville, Kentucky Police Department from he had served with the Maysville, Kentucky Police Department for more than 23 years. And the last six years, he was chief of police. He's a former president of the Kentucky Association of Chiefs of Police and was named Kentucky Chief of the Year in 2001. He didn't ask me to say that, but <laughs> it definitely deserves recognition. So I'm going to bring up his video. Give me just one second. Issue. Nikki, I'll, I'll, I'll. Um, so Nikki, I'm going to um, share your slides here and give me just a second to get those ready. Okay, perfect. And get you. Set. All right, Nikki, I think it's all set for you. Um, let me know if uh, and I'll, I'll be dropping links in the chat for you. So let me know um, if you're all set to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And thank you everybody for having me this morning. I'm gonna apologize in advance for my voice. Wonderful Kentucky allergies have really got me going this morning. Um, but we can go ahead and get started here. So my name is Nikki Milward. I'm the Assistant Director of the Division of Substance Use Disorder in the Kentucky Department for Behavioral Health, Developmental and Intellectual Disabilities. Um, so in our division, we house two branches, the Substance Use Prevention and Promotion Branch, the Substance Use Treatment and Recovery Services Branch, and we also house the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort, the core team. But today I'm just going to do a really quick overview of substance use disorders, how we can support individuals impacted by a substance use disorder, detecting and responding to an opioid overdose, and some community resources and linkages to treatment services. So first we're going to look at the addiction cycle. So addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. So if we kind of look at our um, picture here to the right, we're going to go through the three stages um, of addiction cycle. So the first one is binge intoxication. You can see at the top of our um, 
diagram there. It is um, the stage at which an individual consumes an intoxicating substance and experiences its rewarding and pleasurable effects. That is followed by stage two, which is withdrawal, negative effect, the stage in which an individual experiences a negative physical and emotional state in the absence of the substance. So this can usually start kind of a hangover effect or we're getting withdrawal symptoms. Um, we also could see periods of low mood or depression following um, an event of substance use. And then we get into preoccupation and anticipation, the stage at which one seeks substances, again, after a period of abstinence. So even knowing that we're not gonna feel great, that feeling that we first got at binge intoxication is what we're seeking again. This cycle becomes more severe as a person continues substance use and it produces a dramatic change in brain function and reduces a person's ability to control his or her substance use. The three stages are li linked to and feed each other, but they also involve different brain regions. You can see each stage involves a different region of the brain. So for me, I know that's a lot of words, kind of scientific sounding. So I'm a visual learner. So I hope, um, Hillary, we can get this video to play really quickly that just kind of walks through the addiction cycle for us. You got it, I'm gonna yeah. share. Scientists first began to understand addiction as a brain disorder in the 1950s. Doctors Olds and Milner, in laboratory studies of rats, found the parts of the brain affected by addiction. But then in 1994, doctors Volkov and Shelbert, top neuroscientists, ran PET scans of the brain that showed the effects of substance use disorders. Like other diseases, these scans showed it affected tissue function. There are two main parts of the brain affected by drug use, the limbic system and the cortex. The limbic system, located deep within the brain, is responsible for our basic survival instincts. So when you do essential things to stay alive, like eat, drink, find shelter, have sex, or care for your young, your brain reinforces behaviors that cause the release of dopamine from this region. That reward for surviving is also transmitted to the amygdala and hippocampus, which records a memory of that feeling, so we seek it again. This is our survival hardwiring. Addiction also affects this area up here in the prefrontal cortex, which is what separates us from other animals. This is where decision-making and impulse control live. When drugs or alcohol are used, they activate the same dopamine process in the survival center. And when use is repeated, that substance can hijack that part of the brain. This hijacker changes the brain and weakens this system to make it believe that the primary need for survival is the drug. In hijacking the brain, it can usurp those primary motivations, food, water, shelter, sex, and protecting our young. And the hijacker needs more and more of the substance to activate the same level of reward or feeling of pleasure causing the brain tissue to become increasingly damaged with continued drug use. There are factors that put you at higher risk for the hijacker, including individual factors like genes and age of first use, and then environmental factors like drug availability. But if the hijacker takes hold, addiction is treatable. Advancements have been made in assessments, detox, treatment programs, recovery supports, and medications to treat addiction. Brain scans show that once in recovery, the tissue in the limbic system and cortex can get better. With your help, we can expand these innovations to help millions of individuals and families and ensure that addiction is treated as the medical issue that it is. Great, thank you, Hillary.
Perfect. So after the, um, the video there, we can kind of get into what the treatment recovery landscape looks like in Kentucky. So there are many, many different treatment modalities and treatment settings in Kentucky. So we have inpatient, outpatient, residential, IOP, which is intensive outpatient treatment. So there's many different options for individuals who are seeking treatment. There are FDA approved medications for the use in alcohol and opioid use disorder. Um, there are many different clinical components that make up a treatment um, plan for an individual. So you can have the medical piece, which you kind of see as a med check with the individuals engaged or using medications throughout their treatment. Um, there's counseling, case management, peer support services. So all of these clinical components make up an indiv individualized treatment plan for that patient. It's important to understand that it's not the same for each patient, um, but it needs to be tailored to that specific patient's needs. Um, we also treat specialty populations. So we treat pregnant and parenting women, um, individuals who have are just as impacted, our BIPOC populations, or our Black Indigenous people of color, um, our LGBTQ community. So we want to make sure that we're including all of these um, populations and groups in our treatment landscape. Um, harm reduction is a part of the continuum of care and should be incorporated in all aspects of treatment and recovery services. Recovery meetings or mutual aid meetings are an important component um, in the recovery landscape. Um, so these are going to be your AA, NA meetings, your SMART meetings. There's MARA meetings for individuals who are utilizing medication as part of their pathway to recovery. Um, there's Al-Anon meetings for people, um, for um, parents and loved ones of individuals who use substances. So there's many different resources for um, meeting aspects. In housing, housing has become an important part of our treatment landscape in Kentucky. Um, through the Kentucky ha Recovery Housing Network, we have partnered with NAR, which is a national affiliate, to certify um, recovery housing in Kentucky. So it's interesting, like, we have several, all these treatment options, but there's a, huge, a significant gap in getting people who have a substance use disorder engaged in treatment services. So I thought this was an interesting statistic to share. So in 2021, approximately 43.7 million people aged 12 or older needed substance use treatment in the past year. However, only 6.8 of them received substance use treatment at a specialty facility. Um, so when we start thinking about the gaps or barriers to, to getting people engaged in treatment services, there's many things that kind of come to mind. Um, so it's transportation, you know, just getting to and from appointments can be difficult. Housing is a significant need in Kentucky right now. If you're unhoused, it's extremely difficult to worry about getting into appointments um, and that sort of thing when you don't have somewhere safe to sleep at night. Um, stigma. There is still a tremendous stigma for individuals who are seeking treatment for mental health and or substance use issues. Um, tremendous stigma around medications used to treat these um, diseases. Um, insurance and financial issues. So, you know, maybe you don't have insurance or maybe an individual has a high deductible. Um, that could always play a part in this. And it's important to note that in Kentucky, Medicaid does pay for substance use disorder treatment services and medications utilized. Um, maybe they had a previous negative experience with the healthcare system. Um, many patients come to us in treatment and it takes a while for them to get there to us and they'll tell some really just horrible stories about how they were treated in the emergency department or by a primary care doctor when they realized that they had a substance use disorder. Um, so it's important that we try to engage those individuals as well. Um, we know that we need to close the gap here in Kentucky and engage more individuals in treatment services. So when I was trying to think about how do I talk to a group about the best way to interact with a population that could be using substances or individuals impacted by a substance use disorder. So maybe it's a parent or a neighbor or a loved one of somebody who used substances. And the first thing that kind of came to my mind is the key takeaways from the anti-stigma toolkit um, that the Addiction Technology Transfer Center kind of came up with. And it's a good framework just when we're thinking about engaging with uh, the public or the general population about substance use. Um, so we want to learn more. There is certainly no shortage of accurate information about addiction, treatment, and recovery. Many organizations and government agencies provide information through websites, published documents, and videos um, that is available for everyone to access. 
speak out. As you learn more about addiction, treatment, and recovery, you are more likely to notice misinformation, prejudice, and adverse effects of stigma. Speak out, challenge inaccuracies, educate others, and guide them to authoritative sources of information. You are in a unique position in the library to share your knowledge. Keep hope alive. I know this sounds very simple, but it's very important in the work that we do. People with active addiction can engage in behaviors that test the patience of others. Um, maybe you think you've encountered this in your own libraries when people are acting, um, misbehaving and acting inappropriately. Um, there are times when your frustration leads you to feel that people are beyond help. However, experience demonstrates that people even with severe addiction can recover and live happy, healthy lives. Now, treat people with dignity. Uh, people with substance use related disorders probably include your friends, coworkers, family, and neighbors, although you may not be aware of it. Treat people who have a substance related problem with the same dignity and respect that you would give others and expect from others. Um, think about the whole person. Knowing that someone is in active addiction gives you only a small piece of information about that person. It does not provide sufficient information about who that person is. People are much more than the labels that are placed upon them. And watch your language. We talk about this a lot in healthcare. Um, you know, words can heal, words can hurt, labels can lead to stigma. Uh, you know, we always want to, if we're thinking about talking about a person, we want to use person-centered language. So we don't ever want to say someone's an addict or someone's a junkie. We want to say that someone's a person with a substance use disorder. Um, so just being aware of the language and kind of um, the phrases that we use sometimes to um, describe the population. So when you're thinking about like why the library, um, it was interesting to me to kind of pull some different data pieces. Um, so just thinking about, you know, we had over 100,000 people die from a drug overdose in the U.S. between April 2020 and April 2021. 75, over 75,000 of those are, um, involved opioids. Then we think about public libraries. They are accessible to over 95% of the U.S. population. And opioid use within library walls can be a common occurrence in areas with high opioid use rates. You know, libraries provide a safe, clean environment. You know, they can be coming in to use the resources, the computer, or to charge their phones. Um, you know, they can be there for an extended period of time without raising too many questions. So I think we have, um, we have that, and what I think Vam is probably going to talk about in his video is this the increase of fentanyl in Kentucky and our tainted drug supply. So yes, there's going to be, um, you know, I think the individuals who are coming in who are in active addiction who have an opioid use disorder. But one area I want us to keep just on our radar are individuals who are coming into the library space who are students who don't have an opioid use disorder, who don't have a significant um, substance use history, who maybe bought an Adderall or a Ritalin to come in and get studying done for um, you know, finals or midterms, and that Adderall they bought was actually a fentanyl. So we're seeing more of these poisonings that are happening that aren't necessarily people who have a significant substance use history. You know, recognizing an opioid overdose, we want to make sure that we're, we call 911 immediately. If anybody exhibits any of these symptoms, you know, their face becomes pale or they get clammy to touch, the body goes limp, um, their fingernails or lips will turn a purple or blue color. The individual may start to vomit or make a gurgling noise. It's a very um, different sounding noise. So you'll definitely know that something sounds different. Um, the individual cannot be awakened or is unable to speak. Their breathing or heartbeat slows or stops. Um, I wanted to, to spend a little bit of time just talking about naloxone. Naloxone is a medication that can quickly reverse an overdose by blocking the effects of opioids. It can restore normal breathing um, within two to three minutes. Um, it's a great resource to have on hand. I think it's important to note that in nearly 40% of overdose deaths, someone else was present. So this doesn't mean necessarily that it was someone else who was using substances with them. It could be in a house that a mother or father was home and they didn't know somebody was using in their home. Um, it could be in a public space like a library. 
Um, so it's just important that if we're able to, that we have these life-saving medications available. Um, training and the kits, um, naloxone kits are available through your local health department and regional prevention centers. There are usually uh, mechanisms to cover the cost of these kits. Training will be free through um, the health department or the regional prevention center. And some of you may have heard recently, so on March 29th, the FDA approved over-the-counter naloxone nasal spray. Um, so we are excited for this to happen. Uh, we look forward to happen probably later this year. Um, so that is a great stride forward for us. So one thing that I wanted to highlight is just um, if your library staff experiences an, an overdose event or a mental health event that happens um, in your space, how do we kind of debrief or walk through this? I think this is an important process to have on hand and um, to have as a response to that. So you can look at it like a post-crisis plan would prepare the library to respond um, to an event witnessing an overdose, as well if the patrons or colleagues suffer another type of health crisis or trauma. So we're talking in, in the mind frame of an overdose, but any kind of um, significant medical event, we can kind of follow this. So we want to make sure that we're able to take five minutes to an hour just to kind of pull the staff together. Um, if you're able to close the door during that time, just to give them a minute to breathe, to kind of walk through the process of what just happened, I highly recommend that. You want to include appropriate staff, so all the individuals that were working that day. If you're able to bring the manager in, um, HR if available, um, those are key people to have there for the debrief. Um, you know, you want to have a meaningful discussion. You want to give them space to kind of share openly how they're feeling, what they've witnessed, um, and, and support that. We want to make sure you know, if staff needs somebody else to talk to, if you can work through HR to see a counselor or bring somebody in that they can talk to from outside, I think would be really helpful. This is also an opportunity to revise policy as needed. Um, in the event, did we follow the protocol that we have in place? Did we call 911 right away? Did the staff know that they were supported and trained up um, to handle this event? So I think it's a great opportunity just to debrief, check in on everybody. An overdose event is difficult to witness and to be part of. So I think it's important that everybody comes together as a team to walk through um, what happened. So when we think about, um, you know, potential responses that libraries can have, we, you know, we definitely want to include opioid overdose naloxone training as number one. Um, but staff training on related topics like we're doing today, I think just educating um, staff on substance use disorders, mental health disorders, can really just empower them to know how to respond and how to interact with people who are coming in seeking resources on treatment, recovery, um, those sort of things. Community education events and campaigns. Um, you know, can the library help host education events focused on topics such as substance use disorder, mental health, and general wellness to educate the public on the opioid crisis and help reduce stigma that is associated um, with these different diseases? And facilitate facilities modifications. So one thing you can think about, um, you know, is making physical changes to the building. Um, adding sharps containers to the bathrooms, those sort of things. So here I just want to get into some of our community resources, and I think Van was probably going to touch on this too in his videos. I hope we can get that playing. But this is KY Help. This is the statewide call center that is supported by the Office of Drug Control Policy. Um, what is really great about KY Help is that they have live individuals and answers the phone. Um, so if, an, if a patron or somebody comes into the library who's wanting resources immediately, who wants to be linked to treatment, or they want to find out about, hey, what treatment options are available for me, they can call and get somebody on the phone who will walk through the process with them, go over what insurance they have, see if there's transportation available to get them to the treatment facility. So KY Help is a really great resource to use. The other one is um, findhelpnowky.org. This is an online um, kind of a database, really, of Kentucky's um, treatment facilities. You can go on here and search by treatment setting, if it's inpatient, outpatient, location. So you can pick 
um, a county or a city that's closest to you that you're looking for treatment options. You can, if you're wanting to utilize medication as part of your treatment, you can look to see where you can get access methadone or buprenorphine. You can also plug in your insurance if you have Medicaid or commercial insurance, and it will give you a really nice list of options that will also list if they are accepting patients currently, so you're not wasting your time calling multiple different places. And then we have our community mental health um, centers. So we have 14 in Kentucky. So every county is included in one of the 14 um, um, CMHCs. So they are a behavioral health safety net. Um, they have numerous prevention, treatment, and recovery initiatives that are supported through um, our division and the larger um, department as a whole. But these are really great um, resources to utilize. So if patients um, are looking for counseling, treatment, including medication options. Um, this is just a really good place to start with as well. Okay, and here is a list of some really great ones that I wish I had um, more time to talk about. But um, if you're interested in getting the lock zone, here is a link that will show you the easiest places to access the lock zone. Um, our syringe service programs, our SSPs, are an absolutely phenomenal resource in our communities. Um, so if you have individuals who are coming in, this is a great place um, you know, to make sure that you're including on your resource list, not only so they can come in and get clean supplies, they also have um, serve as a touch point to link to services. Um, they provide free Hep C HIV testing. You can get um, fentanyl test strips. It's just a really great resource to have um, on hand. Our recovery community centers are wonderful. Another great touch point in the community for resources, um, recovery supports. KY Connector is a great in, um, insurance resource that is um, focused on getting individuals linked with Medicaid. So your K local KY Connector can A, look to see if an individual is active with Medicaid, help them complete a Medicaid application if they want to, um, so they can do that with them over the phone. And then also KY Connector is a great resource if we have individuals who are coming out of incarceration, they've been in jail or prison for a significant time and their Medicaid was um, put on hold or turned off during that period and they're trying to get it switched back on. Um, that sometimes is an automatic process, sometimes there's a little bit of delay. So this group at KY Connectors can help individuals with that too. We also have our 988 resource, which is a great resource to share for mental health, substance use, any crisis related event. Um, the 988 call center, when the individual calls, will be routed to their local um, CMHC. So if it's calling from an 859 number, it will be linked to the closest CMHC in the 859 area code area. Um, and the last one is Define Recovery Housing. This is the one that um, List our NARA certified facilities. So these have all been certified through our um, division and um, are great resources for patients who are needing housing. All right, does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, thank you. Taylor, I like to put my email in the, the chat there. That's great. And if anybody ever wants to reach out to me, feel free to do so. Thank you so much, Nikki. And uh, folks, if you want to have, have questions, think of them later. Feel free to type them in the chat. Thank you so much, Nikki. And we do have. Um, OK, we do have Van's uh, video ready to video ready to go. Just popped it up into YouTube, so should be no problem with this. Hello, my name is Van Ingram and I'm executive director of the Kentucky Office of Drug Control Policy in my 19th year with that office. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard about the drug fit. Now, fentanyl is a very good drug. Uh, it's a very good end-of-life drug, very good cancer drug. That's not what's being used on the street is pharmaceutical fentanyl. What has happened is the drug cartels who are on the supply side have changed what, su what supply they're, they're willing to, to give. So for many years, the opioid that they provided was heroin. Now, you may remember, uh, 
a decade or so ago, most of our focus was on prescription opioids. And, and, and states began to crack down on, on, on the prescribing of prescription opioids uh, for non-medical use. Uh, and then a switch began towards heroin. Then as time went on, 2018, 2019, the cartel started switching the product they were willing to deliver from an agricultural product because heroin is, comes from poppies that have to be grown in the fields. Those fields have to be guarded with men with guns. That, that agricultural product has to be collected and turned into a pharmaceutical heroin and then distributed. By switching to fentanyl, the cartels were able to only obtain the chemicals necessary to make the drug fentanyl. They found a ready supply in China. It could be shipped all over the world. Shipping containers can, land, can go anywhere in the world and, and deliver the chemicals needed to make fentanyl. The cartels can secure those, those, those chemicals, manufacture the drug, and distribute it across America. What's more insidious than that is now they're making the fentanyl disguised as a Percocet 30, disguised as a Xanax, disguised as an Adderall. We've had to go away from the, the, the term overdose death. Now often we're seeing our drug poisonings, where a person thought they were taking an Adderall to, so they could study all night, a college student. And in fact, they bought something that was a fit, was fentanyl, uh, was the active ingredient, uh, and it led to their death. So big issue, uh, drug overdose or drug poisoning is the leading cause of death now between 18 to 45 year olds in this country, not automobile accidents as it had been for decades. And just real quickly, this, here's why this, this is not going away anytime soon. There is way too much money in this business model of fentanyl. So between 15 and $20,000, you can buy a kilo of pure fentanyl. If you break that down, that, that can make anywhere from 75,000 to a million, I'm sorry, 75,000 to 100,000 pills. At 10 to $15 a pill, your profit margin is between $750,000 and a million dollars for a $20,000 investment. If you take that all the way through retail sales. So as you can see, that's a model that's not going anywhere. We're stuck with it for a while. We're probably not going to solve it on the supply side, so we have to do some other things. And one of the things that we, we launched uh, last year, early, early into this year, was recovery rate community certification. We've designed a program along with Volunteers of America Mid-State, where counties and cities can become certified as recovery ready because they have the, the things in place around prevention, treatment, and harm reduction that help make a community recovery ready. Things like Celebrate Recovery, regular 12-step meetings, trend service programs, uh, recovery, ready community, uh, recovery community centers, uh, all things to help, help people that are in recovery stay in recovery. And that's been a, bit, a big focus we've had the last few years. We've really worked with the Chamber of Commerce and East Kentucky Concentrated Employment Program to provide jobs to people in recovery. That's the number one thing that helps people stay in recovery is a, is a, is a good job. And we've had a lot of success with that. Uh, so we're, we're hoping all our communities have employers that are willing to, to be a fair chance employer that will help people who are in recovery find meaningful work uh, and, and help them stay in recovery. You can check out more and learn more about recovery ready communities at rrcky.org, www.rrcky.org cky.org. We're also piloting a new program here in Kentucky as a result of a, of a bill that passed in the 2022 session, Senate Bill 90. We have an 11 county pilot program. Those counties are Kenton, Greenup, Letcher, Pulaski, Madison, Clark, Oldham, Davis, Hopkins, Christian, and McCracken. In those communities within 48 hours of an arrest, for a qualifying charge, an individual can be assessed if they are assessed to have a substance use disorder or a mental health disorder, rather than face charges and go on in, into the uh, to prison or, or, or the jail system, they can then 
opt into a year, well, up to a year long treatment program that, that, that works on their substance use issues, works on recovery issues, works on employment issues, ed, adult education issues, all this designed to keep people out of the prison factory and keep them out of the community, addressing their needs in the community. So we're excited to get that going. We've got it started in Kenton and Letcher now, and we'll be adding some more counties very, very soon. There were a couple of bills in this 2023 session uh, that, that will be, we feel will be helpful uh, in recovery. Um, the first one is House Bill 248. And it's a bill that does put some regulation around the sober living community uh, environment. Uh, some, sometimes they're called transitional living. But these are places where people go to live after a treatment stint because they're really not ready to go back home to the environment that they were using in to begin with. But what we have found is some places calling themselves sober living in Kentucky were anything but. And, and there were some, some, some folks out there in that, in that industry, that recovery housing industry, they're really taking advantage of some very vulnerable people. So this, this House Bill 248 creates a, a, a system of, of, of certification an inspection to make sure that vulnerable people are not being taken advantage of in the recovery housing world. House Bill 353 was a bill that removes fentanyl test strips from the definition of drug paraphernalia. You heard me talk about how horrific the fentanyl problem is and how it can be found in everything. It can be disguised as heroin, it can be disguised as cocaine, methamphetamine, and the prescription pills I talked about. The fentanyl test strip will allow people who are still actively using to test whatever it is they're going to use so they'll, they'll know if they're about to be exposed to fentanyl. Um, you know, it's a sad fact. We know that there are people, there, there are lots of Kentuckians who are using actively right now. We wish, wish they would all get into treatment, but they can only, that'll only work when they're ready. Uh, so until that time, we're doing our best to keep them alive through our syringe service programs through fentanyl test strips uh, and doing everything we can to, to keep people alive until that day that, that they can get into recovery. Um, some of you may have heard about the opioid abatement fund. So through a number of lawsuits that have been settled with drug distributors and drug manufacturers, Kentucky is a recipient right now of about $850 million. Um, I suspect that number will grow to a billion before this year is up and some other settlements are, happen. Half of that money, 50%, goes directly to counties and cities that joined in the lawsuits. So most of the Kentucky, counties in Kentucky are receiving money. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is $850 million is a lot of money, but it pays out over 18 years. So it's, 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 it's a long, long payout. The other half goes to the State Opioid Abatement Commission. Now that's at the Office of the Attorney General. Um, you can go to the Office of the Attorney General's website to learn more about the uh, Opioid Abatement Commission. Uh, their director, Brian Hubbard, uh, directs the work of the commission. I'm a member of the commission appointed by, by General Cameron. Um, but, but go there and learn about the commission and learn about the process. Uh, now, we have received hundreds of requests for grants, much, much more than, than our first year funding we have, uh, about four times as much request as money we actually have on hand. Um, but I, the thing to remember is this pays out over 18 years. So um, money will be granted out for a very, very long time. I want to wrap up with telling you about some, some resources. 8338 KYL. This is our statewide call center located in Prestonsburg, Kentucky, operated by Operation Unite uh, through a, a partnership with my with Office of Direct Control Policy. 8338 KY Health or 883-859-4357. It's operated 8 to 10 Monday through Friday and uh, 10 to 6 on Saturday and Sunday. Now we receive about 350 calls a month in there of people looking for help, people looking for help for themselves, for a loved one, trying to understand more about an, addi an addiction, trying to see what kind of treatment is available. You know, there's many different ways to treat uh, a substance use disorder. There are medications, 
there's intensive outpatient, there's outpatient, there's partial hospitalization, there's residential. So there's so many different ways of going at this. The people on the other end of the phone there at 8338-KY-HELP are there to answer questions, to do screenings, to do referrals, uh, and they do a tremendous job. Now, I said we had 350 calls coming in every month. We have about three times that much going out every month because we follow up with every caller at seven days, 30 days, and six months. So everybody gets followed up with, and it's just a tremendous service. Uh, if you're not a talker, you can go to findhelpnowky.org. Um, this is kind of like the Expedia of uh, uh, drug treatment. We have residential programs, outpatient programs, medications programs, all there on that website. This is not a website that was created two or three years ago, and it's outdated now, and it's kept up to date all the time. Providers are required to go in weekly and update their status and, and ensure that all their information is still correct. Uh, so you can trust the information you have there. There's also a sister site, Find Recovery Housing Now, so if you're looking for recovery housing, same thing. You can go there, a few clicks of a mouse, a little bit of information, and you can see what's available uh, and where there are resources at. Finally, let me wrap up by saying this. Um, later this month, naloxone or Narcan, an opioid reversal agent, will be an over-the-counter medication. Um, it'll be about $30 or so uh, retail. Uh, Maybe a little higher than that, but not much. Um, this is a drug that can stop an opioid overdose in its tracks. I call them the defibrillator of our time. Now, uh, overdose death and drug, and drug toxicity poisoning deaths from fentanyl uh, happen at the rate of six times a day here in Kentucky. Now, we received a little bit of good news that, that our, our rate of, of, of overdose death had declined about 5% in 2022 over 2021, but that's not nearly enough. It's far too many Kentuckians still dying every day. Um, and it may be somebody you care about, maybe somebody uh, in, in, in your work or in your place of business. Um, I urge you to, if you don't have naloxone, to get it. Um, if you can't find it, please contact me at van.ingram at ky.gov and we'll help you find it. I hope this information has been useful to you. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me at the email address I just gave you anytime. I'm here to be a resource for you. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody for hanging in there with us with that video. Our next speaker is Brian Reel and he is from the University of Kentucky and Brian, I'm going to Pull up your slides and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. So everyone, my name is Brian Reel and I'm a fairly new assistant professor in the graduate library and information science program at the University of Kentucky. Um, I was invited to speak here today because I did some research a few years back on how public libraries are dealing with the opioid crisis. I should provide some context to how I sort of stumbled into work on this. I was a public librarian in rural Southern Maryland before doing my PhD in Calvert County to be specific. I then had a gap between finishing the PhD and getting my first university faculty job. So I went back to work for the same public library system part-time during that gap time period. I had heard about public libraries dealing with opi opioid users. And I also knew opioid usage was on the rise in Southern Maryland. Many areas were hit far worse than Calvert County, but this was the area where I grew up and at least a couple of my high school classmates had died from this. But back to the library, I was at one of the service desks in 2017 when the training manager for the entire Calvert library system sent out an email to all staff saying that all of us would be undergoing Narcan reversal training. And of course, Narcan and Naloxone are synonyms for each other. After the email went out, I started to notice a flood of reply all emails coming from across staff at all four of the county libraries. 
The health department would be providing the training and offering us doses of naloxone to keep on site. Several of my coworkers were applauding this choice, noting that they had family members who were affected. But others registered serious concerns, some of which were easier to answer than others. Several librarians were worried about side effects from Narcan and whether we could hurt someone if we misdiagnose other medical distress as an overdose. The answer to that one is easy. Naloxone has no negative side effects, or basically no effects, period, for people who aren't experiencing an overdose. However, most of the staff didn't know that yet. Most of the public didn't know that yet. So the imagined risk to librarians caused alarm. And then who is held liable if a librarian accidentally harms a patron in another way while providing this help? We did have a good Samaritan law in Maryland, which prevents people from legal liability if they attempt to provide medical help to a distressed person. And since most staff were CPR and first aid trained, the assessment for that was that any liability in those cases would not fall in the library. But still, library administrators weren't even certain yet. Then we had other matters. What happens if a librarian is harmed? After all, someone who just woke up and is suddenly in complete drug withdrawal may not be happy, to say the least. And then there's a risk of contact with fentanyl and other dangerous substances. The quick response to this was that the training would be mandatory, but using that training was optional. But that still didn't tell us much about relative risk. We also had questions about will public knowledge of librarians having Narcan on site make people think of the library as a safe space for drug use? Regardless of the answer, would public knowledge of us doing this make some people think that the library isn't a safe place for them or their kids? If we know we have a problem with opioids in our community, why are we only responding at the absolute crisis point? Shouldn't we try to engage the community in awareness and prevention? And what can we do to improve our reference resources? Do we have the information we need to refer persons with opioid dependency and their family members to the right community resources? Should we add training and handling needles? Should we install a sharps container in the library for people to safely deposit needles? Or would the mere presence of one look bad and give people the wrong idea about the library? And it just kept going. We had dozens of librarians within our staff of 50 some individuals across four libraries, sending multiple messages with a range of opinions with some folks arguing that we need to help people in need and others unfortunately preaching about personal responsibility and asking why helping persons with opioid dependency should be our responsibility. Part of why this went out of control is that the director of the library system was out of town and not responding to emails. When she did get back, she clamped down on the reply all marathon pretty quick. But as this was happening, I started to take notes. I also did a Google Scholar search and looked through a few other databases, since I assumed that someone had to have written an academic journal article on answering many of these questions for libraries and seeing trends in the field. But as it turned out, nobody had done actual research on this. And as I sent some emails and talked with friends in the library and information science field, I couldn't find anyone who was pursuing this from the academic side of things. This was surprising considering that several high profile news stories had come out in the previous year and a half. This image is from a news story about Shara Kowalski, who was li a librarian at the McPherson Square Library in Philadelphia. Shara had personally reversed dozens of overdoses in and around her library. It seems worth noting that Shara is, without a doubt, one of the strongest advocates for library action in this space. And she has an excellent TEDx Med talk online that is worth watching. But the McPherson Square Library wasn't alone. I could trace libraries across the country 
through various news stories that had experienced overdoses on site. As such, I started to develop some questions from what my coworkers had been asking and figuring out you know, how I could pursue a research study. But in the meantime, a couple things happened before I even launched the study. First, my library system went through its training, which was mostly received positively. Beyond just learning to administer naloxone, the health department brought in a woman who was the mother of an overdose victim in our community and who has, since her son's death, become an advocate for fighting this crisis. Her perspective on substance abuse disorder was very valuable to our library staff. Next, one library branch in each of the two counties adjacent to ours with similar semi-rural populations experienced overdose fatalities in their buildings. That added a sense of urgency to the issue. I decided to write something on this, and that would be informed by some of my basic principles when doing research on public libraries. First, librarians often know more than I do. And with more than 16,000 public libraries buildings in the US, there is always someone with relevant experience they can share. Second, librarians should be able to read my work. If some of the most literate folks out there can't understand what I'm talking about because I'm too bogged down in methodology or using academic jargon, I'm defeating the entire point of what I'm doing. And finally, if I'm going to spend my time writing something, it should be useful to librarians. I wanted to develop something that librarians could use when developing their own programs and policies related to the opioid crisis and for justifying their decisions to outside stakeholders. And I'm sorry that my very annoying cat just burst in. So if you're hearing a meowing, it's not me. As I was developing this project, I got my first faculty job and moved to that university up in Connecticut and a colleague there agreed to be my research partner. She and I interviewed representatives from seven public library systems that had experienced at least one overdose incident in their buildings. I should note that our first interview was with Shara Kowalski at McPherson Square. We coded the interviews according to themes we found among them, which made the writing process much easier. Our final publication was two academic journal articles presented in a part one and part two format, both in the same issue of Public Library Quarterly. Annoyingly, academic journal articles are often behind paywalls, but if any of you would like to read these and don't have easy access, just send me an email and I will very gladly send you the PDFs. We found some interesting things to say the least. I'm just summarizing some key points from about 50 pages of writing. So there's a split between the type of persons using opioids across communities. Libraries located in larger or economically struggling cities saw their populations of persons with opioid dependency overlapping with homeless populations and other at-risk communities. While more affluent or more rural areas saw populations that were more functional on a day-to-day -day basis. So to put it another way, more standard middle-class folks that you would not expect. We also saw a range of decisions about stocking Narcan and training staff to use it. Fear of potential employee harm and staff hesitancy was a common reason for libraries not moving in this direction. But another highly significant factor was police and medical response times. Basically, if emergency response tended to be quick, libraries often chose not to stock Narcan or have their staff trained. With that said, the few libraries that express that have kind of had turnarounds about this largely because of the increased rate of these issues in their communities and realizing that even a three minute response time could be a major issue. 
But one of the most significant takeaways was that Narcan training is useful for pretty much everyone. There will always be some library staff who will just flat out refuse the concept of administering Narcan when someone has experienced an overdose in a library. Several of the respondents recognized this and simply did not make this a requirement for staff or decided that only members of management would need to be ready to use this in an emergency. However, a couple of these libraries still made training in Narcan administration required for all staff. Even if staff could just say, I'm going through this training, but I would not actually use Narcan um, in an emergency situation. As I noted from my personal experience, this training from your local health department or other office always comes with contextual information, similar to some of what we've discussed today. And some folks at my library and the libraries in the study shifted their positions once they threw this training. But as one of the library directors I interviewed noted, your opinion and objections can also change real fast when someone is clinically dead on the floor in front of you. Meanwhile, for libraries debating liability issues, that seems to be moot in most places. Again, almost every state has Good Samaritan laws. Narcan is also relatively harmless compared to other medical interventions librarians are often trained to provide. As Shara Kowalski put it when we interviewed her, when she was discussing CPR, y'all break ribs when you do that. And with what you're doing with a defibrillator, you can cause serious harm. Narcan typically doesn't. But the thing is that Narcan and the crisis point when you actually reach an overdose in a library is just part of this. The general consensus from my research was that persons experience opioid dependency and other issues are still patrons. They have a right to use the library. And across the board, the interviewees discussed assisting these persons in finding essential quality of life services as an extension of core information services that librarians have traditionally provided. We librarians have developed reference knowledge for specific information and developed connections to local community organizations for patron referrals for more than a century in the US. The content and purpose are different now, but the skills are the same. The levels of compassion among interviewees varied, or perhaps that's somewhat unfair. Some of our interviewees for our research had a good bit of pragmatism behind their answers. As an example, I had one librarian say that they had asked homeless persons to leave when they were caught using the bathroom sink as a shower or if their hygiene was outright disruptive. However, they were able to refer that person to local organizations where they could get a shower or laundry services. Likewise, librarians have become prepared to answer questions about where to get help with substance abuse disorder treatment or where to find clean needles. So this is a balancing act for libraries and certainly a change for more traditional services. And that was sort of the point of the research and the articles we published. Public libraries are a middle-class luxury for people with free time to read and attend programs, but they are also a lifeline for people in need. There is often conflict between these two groups, the people who treat libraries as a luxury and people who need libraries. And the presence of persons in need of services often deter people who treat the library as a place for leisure from hanging around. We also have the issue of potential staff trauma and burnout. It's great to see news stories about people like Shara Kowalski doing things like rushing out with Narcan to help people who are experiencing an overdose outside her library. But something that she really emphasized during her interview was that this was emotionally exhausting. But I think librarians are more than capable of developing the skills to handle whatever community challenges are thrown at them and figuring out this balance. 
something that can help is learning from other disciplines. And on that note, you know, I started with some of the opioid research, but this is an article that just literally came out this morning that I published on social workers in public libraries, and I'm dropping a link to this in the chat. It should be free for folks right now. Um, in terms of figuring out engagement with patrons, how to speak to somebody who is in need, how to know the balance of when to approach, when not to approach. Social workers have been doing this for years. And also a large part of social work service is just reference and referrals to other organizations, knowing what community resources you have and things like that. It's not that much different from reference services that we already have. It's just a different perspective. And even for smaller libraries that are not going to be following a recent trend of hiring a social worker to work in a library, just opening up the door and having some conversations with people who have been doing this sort of work and engagement can be useful in rethinking um, how you do reference, how you do staff training, how you do engagement with patrons. So again, I just shared the link for that. I hope it's useful for some of you. Um, I'd also like to talk about some work that a colleague of mine, Shannon Oltman, has been doing. The Flor Florida State University has a program called the Southeast Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Regional Center, just rolls off the tongue, or ROTA RC which is providing a lot of information for public libraries on um, substance abuse disorder, opioid dependency, giving some basic PDFs that staff can print out for their own use, their own information, but also to be able to hand to people at the reference desk and so on. Um, and they also host a large number of trainings for librarians. So, it doesn't help much for me to have the links here on screen, so I'm dumping them in the chat as well. For those of you who are interested in following up on what we've done today, some of the information I just provided should be useful for you and your staff. So just to conclude, I want to say that us at University of Kentucky um, in the School of Information Science, we want to support public libraries however we can through our research, through our teaching, through whatever else we can do. And if there's any ever any way that we can be involved in advocacy or other ways of helping you in the future, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for your time and sharing your expertise. And I'll just ask if anyone has questions for Brian, go ahead and chat those in. Um, we are gonna go ahead and move on to our last presenter for the day. And that is Hilary Ritt. She is our workforce and adult services consultant. I think I got that in the right order. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you, Hilary. Well, good morning. I'm I'm going to really kind of bring this um, all together. And I, I want to touch on the, something that Nikki said earlier, keeping hope alive. And then what Brian just said, um, reference and engagement. And so those are what I'm going to kind of touch on here. I'm going to share both some groups that you can partner with and then some additional resources that you can think about as you're working not with those, just those who have uh, substance use disorder, but their family members. So um, first gonna touch on partners and you'll see these here. We'll kind of go through quickly, but we're gonna touch on those here. So the first one is the Family Resource and Youth Services Center. I bring them up because um, they are in a couple of counties in Kentucky, they, Family Resource Centers are offering kinship support groups for grandparents and other relatives who are raising children who their parents are not able to do so. And so how can you potentially, you, your library may already be partnering with a Family Resource Center. And I, I wanna say, if you already partner with any of these groups that I'm mentioning, please feel free to type in the chat the ways that you're partnering and how, how those partnerships have gone. But some partnership opportunities with the Family Resource Centers. Can your library create bibliographies specific to um, grieving or um, maybe a parent who has an addiction? I know um, the American Psychological Association has 
a lot of books uh, related to things related to social issues. So can you create biographies, um, bibliographies related to that? Or would you be able to offer a presentation to the um, kinship group about your library story times and other resources that are available to help support those um, kinship caregivers? Could your library even host a, a group of, with the kinship caregivers? Is your meeting room space available? And next, um, Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families. This is a, a state organization. Uh, they do provide support to children and families who are grieving the loss of a loved one. That is not limited to opioid um, overdose. That could be any kind of um, death, but they have teen support groups uh, that, they're, that are teen led called Peer Healing. And they also provide a lot of resources and statistics on their website. To connect with them uh, and see what what resources that you may be able to provide to your your library customers. Next is Kentucky Moms Matter, and the Matter stands for Maternal Assistance Towards Recovery. This is a, is a state uh, led uh, initiative that helps expectant uh, mothers who are at risk for use, substance use disorders. I've listed their information on the screen. They have virtual baby showers and healthy baby events that they offer. Could, could your library potentially uh, host one of those or at least um, let publicize those events uh, on your community board? The, I have got the screenshot of their map, but uh, their, their service map. They, I've also included their service map and the contact information for them in the resources that are available in your course guide. I've also included some referral forms, so you could have those available. They have referral forms. A, a person can self-refer or um, a community member can refer. A person that maybe you think might be, um, be able to use the, the Kentucky Moms Matter Support Service. And so those forms are also available in the uh, resource packet that's uh, through your course guide. But, Additional, addition way, additional way you can maybe partner with Kentucky Moms is uh, letting them know about your story time schedule, the, the local providers that um, support Kentucky Moms, or maybe uh, let them know about Dolly Parton Imagination Library and how if they have other children or the child that they're expecting, um, let, getting them signed up for, for that. We've already touched on local uh, health departments and community mental health centers, so I won't really uh, talk about that much, but uh, certainly you can reach out to them for more information and training and support. Now I just want to touch on other ways you can uh, provide support and this kind of, some of it is more in the uh, reference, but we've, we've touched on that too already with providing bibliographies. I do want to highlight um, Johnson County Public Library and some, then some other resources here. So Johnson County Public Library in two, since 2013 has worked with a local um, center that provides um, treatment for substance abuse for women. It's called the Changes Center. And the library weekly um, provides uh, programming for women that are in this, uh, clients that are in this center. Uh, they like to do crafts. Um, the director, uh, Christy Terry, shared with me that crafts are a favorite with the clients, but they also um, do inform, provide information sessions about local resources and then educational programming that you see there. So that could be an opportunity for you to connect with uh, clients and other community members, uh, ways pointing them to library resources that exist and then just connecting them with uh, other, other folks who uh, can help support them. I've got a couple of resource, resources I want to share with you. The first is actually um, a resource guide that I, we've created, and I'm going to actually um, try and show you here just a second. And, and uh, it is an Excel spreadsheet that, um, oh, wrong thing, sorry. Back here.
All right, thank you all for your patience. So there are multiple tabs on this resource guide. Uh, several um, of them have multiple <laughs> things listed here. I don't want it to be overwhelming, but I did want to provide some comprehensive information for you. So this first tab has articles. They're very current, including an article about uh, Narcan just becoming available, FDA approved over the counter. Uh, then there are bibliographies and program resources here. Um, and then state and federal resources. Some of the resources that were shared already today. We've even got contact information for our presenters. Uh, then organizations, so um, organizations like uh, the Kentucky um, uh, family, uh, grieving family resources. So, and then some videos. So just, um, this is available in the, um, your course area, course room, but do want to let you know that this is, this exists. You are welcome to let me know if additional, you want additional resources added. Um, Dr. Reel's articles are listed in the article section with the citations, um, not the newest one, of course, but uh, th those are here too. So I'll stop sharing this, but do want to let you know about that. Go back to my uh, slides. And thank you all for your patience with the transition there. The last or the second resource that was mentioned on, on my slide here is the uh, Administrative Office of the Courts does a uh, community um, court designated worker, uh, community resource directory, and it uh, provides all sorts of things. So information about transportation resources and um, housing, uh, but and even provides this local school number. So uh, they are specific to county and they are created by a, a person who's local to that community. I've already touched on bibliographies, but these are some bibliographies that could be, if you want to create your own, of course, uh, you're gonna know what materials are in your library um, best, but uh, there are some couple of resources here I've provided. One is Tough Topics, and that is going to include things uh, not just related to the um, opioid crisis and overdose um, deaths, but could be a starting point to hand to someone who has come in and expressed, I have a, I have a grandchild whose who's, um, parent just passed away. What kind of resources can I give them? This is something you could have on, on hand. And lastly, um, but this is, and this doesn't add uh, really anything to your, your workload per se, um, other than maybe publicizing it to uh, these community partners. But I, when I was working on this webinar and preparing for it, I talked with one of our experts and he said, uh, promoting the leisure activities and sober social events in the community can encourage those who suffer from substance use disorder. It can give them a reason to live. And the person who shared this with me is a recovering, is recovering from substance use disorder. And I thought, well, libraries do that all the time. We've got tons of things going on all the time that are sober social events. And so, um, and I've just highlighted some of them here, author events, special presentations, game nights, Dungeons and Dragons, puzzle competitions, you name it, you already doing all these things. The only thing you would have to do is maybe let the, those community mental health centers know that, hey, by the way, these are the events we're doing this week. If any of your clients might want to, to come uh, to let them know, uh, let your community action agency know when story time is. Just, just to kind of help folks be aware of what you are already doing that could, could help potentially save a life and, and again, keeping hope alive for those who um, have also been impacted by it, not just those who are suffering from the disorder, but uh, their family members and friends. And I think that is it, but just wanna thank you all so much for uh, letting me share these resources and do check out the resource guide. There's lots of information there for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. And I'm just gonna wrap up with a, a thanks for uh, all of our attendees for being here today. And we also can't forget to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for their sponsorship of this webinar and so many of our services here at KDLA. And we wanna thank all of you for attending today. I hope this was useful and hopefully you got some more resources, some more ideas for ways uh, to serve in this capacity. And I do wanna pop in a quick link to our survey about today's webinar, just four questions. So if you could take a couple minutes to fill that out, we greatly appreciate your feedback on our webinars and, and what you'd like to be trained on. Please feel free to let us know.
This webinar was recorded and it will be available within one week in our online learning portal for you to, um, if you'd like to go back and review anything or have anybody at your library watch it. And the, as I mentioned, all of the, the slides and handouts that were talked about today, including all the links, um, are available to download in the Blackboard Learn window, including the awesome resource guide that Hillary put together. It's got so much great information in it. And if you're attending live today, then you'll get a certificate of attendance uh, in your online learning portal and your dashboard uh, within just a couple days, hopefully. <laughs> so again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you. Let's see, Brian is still here. Thank you so much, Brian, and to Hillary for being my co-pilot on putting this together. And whenever you're ready to exit the webinar, you can just close out your tab. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great afternoon, everybody.